okay, so this chapter is about uh, micro, <clears throat> excuse me, in human interactions. It is about disease and uh, some epidemiology and the interaction between disease and microbiota. Um, the, after this, the uh, last three lectures after tonight are all on immunology, about innate immunity, adaptive immunity, and last lecture will be on immunological diseases. So we're gonna talk about the uh, terms colonization, infection, and disease. We'll talk about various sites where normal biota is found in humans. And we'll also talk a little bit about the Human Microbiome Project. Infection is a condition which pathogenic microorganisms penetrate host defenses, inner tissues, and multiply. This can result in a pathological state, which is accumulative effects of infection, damage, disruption of tissues, and results in disease. So disease is broadly anything deviates from health. So that's not just infections. Uh, diet can affect your, uh, can, can create a diseased state. Genetics, in other words, being born with a genetic defect and even aging can be considered a disease state. Infectious disease is disruption of tissues or organs caused by microbes or the products of microbes. Our normal biota is a large diverse collection of microbes living on us and in us. These uh, microbes for the most part do not cause a disease state and can actually even be either benign or can be a benefit for us. Uh, other terms that are used are resident or indigenous biota or normal flora. These include bacteria, fungi, protozoan, viruses, including uh, the viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, all these, this collection of organisms in us have a profound effect on our human biology. The normal biota is a diverse collection and is, I'm sorry, the slide didn't progress. Try that again. I'm also in the middle of letting people in. Uh, relationships between resident, transient, and disease-causing microbes. Uh, so the resident microbes in this picture here are represented by the green, widely dispersed throughout the body or on the body. Uh, the red is disease-causing microbes. And non-disease but transient microbes are represented by the blue dots. So you can see that uh, you can have a lot of different uh, states going on at the same time. Obviously, disease-causing microbes can result in infection. And the transient microbes uh, usually do not cause a problem. Microbes, they're not colonizers. When they come in contact with the holiobiont, that would be our microbiome. Most of the time they are transient and are gone. A small percentage of them though can uh, cause disease, cause infection and disease. Excuse me, professor. Sorry. To yes. Me. Are we doing the test today? Because it's not showing up. Um, it should, everyone else has been able. Are you, uh, I know previously people had a problem with uh, their computer not being in the right time zone. Do you know how to check that? Go to your settings and check to make sure you're in the right time zone. Um. You might have to go to McGraw Hill, Professor. Pardon? She probably have to go to McGraw Hill because I get a little bit I got other classes. I keep forgetting you have to go to McGraw Hill. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry. Yes, you need to click on uh, McGraw Hill. 
uh, in the Canvas. The, the, the test is not posted in Canvas. You click on McCraw Hill and go through uh, McCraw Hill Connect to get to the exam. Yeah, I just found it there. Thank you. You did? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Let me know if you have any problems. Okay, so human cells, our body has about 22,000 uh, genes encoding proteins, microbes. When you add up all the, the genes of all the various microbes, it's about 8 million. So we have a lot of microbes uh, now in places that we used to think even just a few decades ago, or even less than a decade ago, we have microbes in places in our body that we used to think were sterile. All healthy people harbor potentially dangerous pathogens, but there are low enough numbers that our immune system can keep them in check. The makeup of your intestinal biotic can influence many facets, facets of your overall health. Differences in the gut microbiome have preliminarily been associated with risk for Crohn's disease, obesity, heart disease, asthma, autism, diabetes, and can even in, uh, affect our mood. Current understanding of sites containing normal microbiota, sites previously uh, known to harbor normal microbiota over the skin, mucous membranes, the upper respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, including the mouth, the outer portion of the urethra, external genitalia, the vagina, external ear canal, and external eye, the lids, and for example. Additional sites now thought to harbor at least some normal microbiota. So we used to think that the lower respiratory tract was sterile, but it does have some microbes. The bladder used to be considered sterile. Uh, it's now thought to harbor some bacteria, breast milk, even ambionic fluid in the fetus. Sites in which DNA from microbiota has been detected include the brain and the bloodstream. Benefits of our normal microbiota. They can influence the development of our organs, prevent the overgrowth of harmful microorganisms, uh, microbial antagonism, the general antagonistic effect of good microbes have against intruder microbes. The microbes in a steady state establish relationships that are unlikely to be displaced by incoming microbes. So once uh, microbes have become established as part of your biome, they, they, they sort of guard that uh, territory and try to exclude uh, any other microbes from it. Factors that weaken host defenses and increase our susceptibility to infection. The uh, age is very important. The very young and the very old can have weakened defenses. Genetic, sorry, the cat is being annoying. Genetic defects in immunity and acquired uh, defects in immunity, such as AIDS. Uh, pregnancy, surgery and organ transplants, underlying disease, cancer, liver malfunction, diabetes, uh, chemotherapy, immune suppressive drugs, physical and mental stress, and other infections. So having a previous infection can make you even more susceptible to another infection. That's why uh, in case you didn't notice, the, if you uh, went to the drugstore they, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, the uh, pharmacists were asking everybody, have you had your flu shot? And they would also ask you in older people if you had your pneumonococcal shot, which uh, protects you against pneumonococcal pneumonia. Endogenous infections are caused by biota already in the body. These can occur when the normal biotic gets introduced to a site that was previously sterile. For example, E. coli entering the, the bladder can result in urinary tract infection. And the cat's got to stop bugging me. 
The growing number of doctors and scientists believe fetuses are seeded with normal microbiota in utero. These microbes are important for a healthy full-term pregnancy and healthy newborns. We know exposures occur during birth when the baby becomes colonized with the mother's vaginal biota. This is just a graphic representing that. Uh, also, uh, breast milk contains about 600 species of bacteria and sugars that uh, babies cannot digest, sugars used by the healthy gut bacteria. Breast milk may be necessary for maintaining a healthy gut microbiome in the baby. So these are some representative uh, examples of bacteria and where they're found, the respiratory tract, upper respiratory tract, that's the nose, gram-positive bacteria, some, and also some gram-negative bacteria. Approximately 30% of subjects carry Staphylococcus aureus in, your no in their nose. The respiratory tract further down the throat, Streptococcus, bacterium. sorry about that, which is a, um, a spore-forming uh, gram-positive bacteria, lactobacillus, sorry about that again, I have a little trouble with my mouse. Um, the GI tract oral cavity, you can see a more diverse uh, gram-positive, gram-negative, fungi, and protozoan. The GI tract and intestinal tract, gram-negative bacteria, fewer gram-positive bacteria. And there's also uh, fungi, candidia, is a common fungus found throughout our digestive tract. And also the uh, it's worth noting the uh, fecal biota consists mainly of anaerobes or ones that are air tolerant or facultative anaerobes like E. coli. Seemed like I skipped ahead there. The condition. So a condition in which pathogenic microorganisms penetrate host defenses, enter the tissues and multiply, what is that referred to? It's referred to as an infection. The Human Microbiome Project collects genetic sequences of microbes from the body tissue. True or false, lung, the lungs are considered sterile sites. Anybody? False. It is false. We now know that uh, both the upper and, and lower uh, respiratory tract does have bacteria. Can your gut uh, biota determine your mood and mental health? Yes. Yes, that's actually true. Uh, list and describe three factors that weaken host defenses and increase susceptibility to disease. Having a previous infection. A previous infection is one. Diabetes. Pardon? Diabetes. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. I couldn't hear you. Diabetes. Yeah. Um, uh, things also like uh, having a transplant because you're on immune suppressive drugs um, and so on. Um, true or false, babies born by cesarean section are colonized by the same biota as babies born vaginally. Um, false. Actually, I don't think I pointed that out in the slide, but the biota is, is different for babies born by cesarean section. 
The progress of an infection explains some of the variables that influence whether a microbe will cause disease, differentiate between a microbe's pathogeneity and its virulence, list the steps a microbe has to take to get to the point where it can cause a disease, list several portals of entry and exit, define infectious dose and explain its role in establishing infection, describe three waves that microbes can cause tissue damage. Um, boy, a lot of uh, <laughs> learning outcomes here. Compare and contrast characteristics of exotoxins and endotoxins. We have previously talked about those to a certain extent. Explain what an epigenetic change is and how it can influence virulence. Draw and label a curve representing the course of a clinical infection. Differentiate among the various types of reservoirs, providing examples of each. List six different modes of horizontal transmission, providing infectious disease spread by each. Define healthcare associated infection, listing the most common types. Also, talk about, I think we might have talked about previously, but we're going to talk about Koch's postulates and explain the alternative methods for. Identifying etiological agent, that's the causative agent of a disease. So a pathogen <clears throat> whose uh, relationship with the host is parasitic results in infection and disease. True pathogens capable of causing disease in healthy persons with normal immune systems. Uh, then there's opportunistic pathogens. They cause disease when host defenses are compromised. So this can be compromised by a previous disease state, uh, person being in poor health because of diet or uh, other uh, conditions like having cancer. Uh, when they become established in the part of the body that is not natural to them, that could be uh, another thing that can happen with opportunistic uh, pathogens. <clears throat> so this is a little complicated. It, we talk about virulence. Uh, if you were to compare uh, a microbe that had low virulence, percentage of optimal infectious doses low, and a correct portal of entry, a host with a genetic profile that can result in disease, and, uh, but having a high level of general health, the microbe passes through unnoticed. But a microbe that has higher virulence than the previous one, a higher percentage of optimal infectious dose. So the infectious dose is what the number of microbes or viruses it takes to establish an infection. So this can vary with uh, different uh, bacteria, different viruses. And that's always a concern. Uh, you know, just being exposed to a bacteria or virus doesn't mean you'll necessarily get infected. It's going to depend on the number of either virus particles or bacteria. It's going to depend on their virulence and on your overall health. So in this example, person still has a genetic profile that can result, genetic profile that results in nonspecific defenses that, I'm sorry, a genetic profile that resist microbex, their nonspecific defenses. That's uh, this column. So previous exposure to microbe X, they might have specific immunity. So in other words, maybe a vaccine or previous infection. So the person, and they have a high level of good health, the microbe passes through unnoticed or the microbe becomes established without a disease necessarily happening, like be, becoming asymptomatic. In this case, 
low virulence, low percentage of optimal infectious dose. A, a person has good innate defenses and good overall health, micro passes through unnoticed. Down here, when the virulence is high, the percent optimal infectious dose is present, not good uh, innate defenses, and maybe a moderate level of general health, the microbe can cause disease. So it's a lot of different factors is the point here, how virulent something is, what the infectious dose is, how well your uh, innate defenses resist the infection and what your overall level of health is. And so there's uh, all those can uh, result in different outcomes. So a system of biosafety categories. I had to go to this because I'm having trouble seeing the slide in me. I'm having trouble getting out of this bar here. Let's see if I can move that around. Okay. So uh, there's a system of biosafety categories adopted by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. It is based on the general degree of pathogeneity and the relative danger. So this is what they recommend for laboratories studying different diseases. So biosafety level one in a laboratory, that would be an open bench, no special facilities needed. This is typical of most microbiology teaching labs. So if you had an open lab right now, which unfortunately you don't, it would be considered a biosafety level one. It's considered to have low infection hazard, microbes not generally considered pathogens uh, that will not colonize the bodies of uh, healthy individuals such as Micrococcus luteus, Bacillus magnetarium, Lactobacillus, and so forth. A level two facility, at least level one facility and practices plus personnel must be trained in handling the pathogen. <clears throat> this requires lab coats, gloves, required safety cabinets are needed, biosafety ha uh, hazard signs are posted. These come with working with agents that uh, have a moderate potential to infect class two pathogens that can cause disease. Most of, the, most of these include Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, Salmonella, can also include uh, pathogenic worms, hepatitis A and B, uh, chance exposure rabies. So I work in a level two biosafety. Uh, it's mainly because we handle uh, plasma, urine, and serous samples from participants in various studies. And so there's always a risk that they could be uh, infected with hepatitis A or B, uh, HIV also. <clears throat> so biosafety level three, so all the, the uh, conditions of a level one and two. Uh, this is agents that can cause, when you're handling agents that can cause severe or lethal disease, especially when inhaled, such as tuberculosis, uh, Yersinia pestis, uh, so on, yellow fever, HIV. A biosafety level four, all the things concerned in a level three, Clothing changes and showers are required for all people entering and leaving. Materials must be autoclave or fumigated prior to entering or leaving the lab. This is agents that are highly virulent that propose 
extreme list of more uh, risk of morbidity and mortality when inhaled in droplet and aerosol form. So exotic flavoviruses, uh, various uh, viruses like Ebola, Marburg. I'm sure that facilities that work with COVID-19 would have to be uh, considered uh, level four because it's so infectious. So virulence is the degree of pathogeneity indicated by microbes ability to establish itself in the host and cause damage. Virulence factors, that's a characteristic or structure of a microbe that contributes to toxin production or introduction of injurious host response. So for example, when we uh, talk about some of the respiratory viruses, the flu, uh, COVID, they have those protein spikes that enable them to uh, bind the cells. Those would be considered a virulence factor. Toxins released by bacteria into the environment, destructive enzymes, all those are virulence factors. Uh, the endotoxin that we had talked about very early on, that's part of the uh, lipopolysaccharide layer of gram-negative bacteria, that is a virulence factor. Infectious dose, so what would be the minimum number of microbes required for an infection to proceed? So this has to be determined experimentally for many microbes. <clears throat> Microbes with smaller infectious doses have greater virulence. So in other words, um, if it takes fewer microbes to establish an infection, it's more virulent. I think, <clears throat> though I'm not positive about this, but I think one of the concern with the variants of COVID-19 it requires a shorter exposure time, which probably means people can get infected with a lower dose. Uh, these variants must be more, uh, have greater ability to establish an infection and in at lower numbers and can uh, spread very rapidly. So the uh, steps in causing disease in a host finding a portal of entry. That can be the skin, GI tract, respiratory tract, your genital tract, or uh, endogenous biota. Attaching uh, firmly. So for the example, in the case of bacteria, this could be the fimbriae. Capsules also help them to uh, attach surface proteins on viruses, whether they are enveloped or naked viruses, they have those viral spikes. Also being able to survive host defenses. So there's various mechanisms that uh, disease causing organisms have. One is avoiding phagocytosis, uh, having a capsule can help them avoid phagocytosis. Some uh, can even survive inside a phagocytic cell. And the host not having a specific immunity through power exposure, causing damage. Uh, bacteria, some bacteria can re release destructive enzymes or toxins. Uh, they, uh, bacteria and viruses can cause an excessive host response, an extreme inflammatory state, uh, referred to as a cytokine storm. These are various inflammatory factors that our body releases and in some cases can result in an overreaction to a disease state. Also epigenetic changes in host chromosomes. So, um, we're not going to talk a lot about this, but epigenetic changes, these are things that affect the ability of our uh, genes to be expressed. Uh, factors, uh, they, are, they can be inherited, but they are not themselves. They are not genes, but just factors on our chromosomes. 
and uh, well, we'll just leave it at that. Exiting a host, there's portals of exit, a respiratory tract, obviously, salivary glands, skin cells, fecal matter, urogenital tract, uh, blood. These can all result in not only exit, but transmission of the disease. <clears throat> Portals of entry, it's a characteristic route taken by a microbe to initiate infection. It is usually through the skin, uh, breaking in the skin, mucous membranes. Exogenous uh, is origins from outside the body in the environment from another person or from an animal. Endogenous would be uh, already something already existing on or in our bo body. So this is normal biota, or maybe even a previously silent infection. So usually some compromise in a person's health can result in the nor normal biota, uh, allowing it to establish the infection. Sites of entry can be nicks, cuts, abrasions, punctures. Some can be tiny, even inapparent. Intact skin is a very tough barrier that few microbes can penetrate. If you've had any anatomy, they might have talked about the structure of skin. You actually have four layers, and it's a very uh, a good barrier for us. Some infectious agents create their own passageways in the skin through digestive enzymes. So sometimes a small, even a small cut, if bacteria can get in there, they can then start breaking down the tissue and penetrating deeper into your body. Entry through food, drink, or ingested substances. So uh, uh, the these, uh, food spoilage and contamination can result in infection, uh, adaption to survive digestive enzymes and even the high pH of the stomach. Uh, gateways to the respiratory tract start with the oral cavity and the nasal cavity, continuous Mucosa membrane covered the upper respiratory tract, sinuses, and the auditory tubes of our ears. Uh, microbes often transfer from one site to another. And the extent at which an agent's carried into the respiratory uh, trees based on its size. So smaller things can penetrate further into the respiratory tract. Small cells, uh, as this says, are inhaled. I would love to set deadlines to do all my work and do it that way. I actually read more. I wish that you would um, not wait for Sexually transmitted diseases, STIs, pathogens transmitted by sexual means account for 4% of the infections worldwide. In the United States, 13 million new cases occur each year. Entry points through the skin and the mucosa, uh, obviously the genitalia, the, including the penis, the vagina, in the cervix, and the urethra. During pregnancy and birth, the placenta is an exchange organ. It's formed by maternal and fetal tissues. It separates the blood of the developing fetus from that of the mother. It permits diffusion of dissolved nutrients and gases to the fetus. Few microbes can cross the placenta and are spread by the umbilical vein into the fetal tissue. Other infections are transmitted perinatally as the child passes through the birth canal. Uh, the mother, parts of her immune system, uh, certain antibodies can pass from the mother uh, through the placenta to protect the baby. So this is just a diagram of that, uh, showing the possible route of entry uh, of infection of the mother into the baby.
So TORCH is uh, an acronym, Common Infections of the Fetus and Neonate. So TORCH stands for toxoplasmosis. Uh, that's a, a, a eukaryote uh, pathogen transmitted through uh, animal feces. Uh, o stands for other diseases, syphilis, Coxsackie virus, Varicella zostra virus, AIDS, chlamydia. R stands for rubella, C, a cytomegalovirus, and H, the herpes simplex virus. So to establish infection, you need adhesion, a process by which a microbe gains a more stable foothold on host tissues, depends on the binding between specific molecules on both the host and the pathogen. So for example, the flu virus uh, attaches to our respiratory epithelia. It has those two spikes, the hemagglutin spike to attach and neuromenidase, which is an enzyme to penetrate through the mucosal layer. The COVID has uh, three uh, different spikes and it binds to a widely distributed uh, receptor called an ACE, uh, which is a, actually an enzyme on our cells regulating blood pressure. So that is widely distributed. And that's why one of the reasons uh, COVID so virulent because it cannot, it can not just bind to the respiratory epithelia, but a lot of other cells in our body that have this, what's called an ACE receptor. A particular pathogen can be limited not only to those cells and organisms to which it can bind. Once a, a pathogen attaches, it can invade other body compartments. In the case of a lot of bacteria. Uh, quorum sensing, this is a chemical communication between nearby bacteria. In other words, they can release chemicals, enable them to communicate with each other and establishment, it's important for the establishment of an infection. So this just shows you some of the mechanisms, those little hair-like projections on bacteria called fimbriae, allow them to attach. Capsules on the bacteria can actually help them avoid phagocytosis. Uh, viruses have the protein spikes. They can bind to areas on the cells and it allows them to then be taken up by the cell and enter the inside. Because if you remember the viruses or obligate intercellular parasites, they have to get inside your cell in order to replicate. Some uh, mechanisms uh, different bacteria have, uh, the Neisseria that causes gonorrhea, they have fimbriae to attach to genitalia epithelia cells, E. coli that can cause diarrhea, uh, another bacteria, Shigella, can cause dysentery. It can attach to uh, intestinal epithelia. Mycoplasm, uh, the, if you remember, that was the very small bacteria. They do not have a cell wall. They just have some sterols in their cell membrane, but they can cause pneumonia. They have a specialized tip allows them to fuse tightly to lung epithelia. Pseudomonas can be a problem in burn and lung infections, uh, with the, also with the fimbriae for attachment, and they can create a slime layer. Streptococcus pyrogens, the lipotechoic acid in the cell wall, and also the capsule allow them to bind the epithelium. Influenza virus, we already mentioned, uh, they have receptors to bind to cells. Polio virus, 
They have capsid proteins with receptors to bind the susceptible cells. AIDS virus, they have also viral spikes, allows them to attach to white blood cells. In particular, uh, one that we will talk about is a T helper cell. Gerardia, it's a eukaryotic protozoan, has a small suction disc on the underside, allows it to attach to intestinal surfaces. Now, our defenses, uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk more a lot more detail in the immunology section but we have phagocytic cells we actually have several kinds of phagocytic cells and these are white blood cells that can engulf and destroy pathogens they actually take them inside the phagocytic cell and they have destructive enzymes and antimicrobial chemicals to break down the virus or the bacteria uh, pathogens, they can have virulence factors to avoid phagocytosis or to even circumvent the process. Some bacteria, like the ones that cause tuberculosis, can actually survive inside the phagocytic cell without being uh, broken down. So this is just an example of a possible infection. So cells are packed pretty tightly together. They have an extracellular matrix so they can uh, adhere to each other and to a, also to a basement membrane. The bacteria, if they can uh, get down through that barrier, they can start releasing enzymes. There's the, the exotoxins that can disrupt the cells. Uh, this is an example of phagocytic cell and having the capsule can help block the phagocytosis. These are all considered uh, toxins, the enzymes, the capsule, these are all considered virulence factors. They uh, increase the capabilities that allow a pathogen to cause infection, adaptations that a microbe uses to invade and establish itself in a host, and they can determine the degree of tissue damage that's caused by the invading microorganism. So there's different classes. There's exoenzymes, so bacteria, fungi, protozoan, and worms. They can all secrete enzymes into the environment that can break down and inflict damage on tissue. They dissolve host defense barriers and promote the spread of the microbes into deeper tissues. Some of the enzymes that uh, microorganisms can have a mucinase that can break down the mucus, a keratinase, which is a protein in the skin, hyaluronase, hyaluronic acid, that actually plays an important role in that extracellular matrix that helps cells to adhere to each other. And uh, these are just some of the enzymes that bacteria and microorganisms can have. A toxin, there's two broad categories, but a toxin is a specific chemical product of microbes, also plants, some animals, and it is poisonous to other organisms. An exotoxin is any toxin usually a protein that's secreted by living bacteria. There are many types of exotoxins. Uh, botulinum toxin is a neurotoxin, for example, secreted by the Clostridium bacteria. Endotoxin is not actively secreted. Remember, it's part of the LPS layer of gram-negative bacteria, and therefore is only found in gram-negative bacteria. So some of the uh, compare and contrast exotoxins, 
They are toxic in very small amounts. Endotoxin is toxic in high amounts. Exotoxins are usually specific to a cell type. And uh, whereas endotoxins more generalize, it can cause systemic fever and inflammation. Uh, the exotoxins are small proteins. The endotoxin is a lipopolysaccharide of the cell wall. Exotoxins are not very stable. They can be uh, broken down by pH, by heat. The endotoxin is very stable. Uh, exotoxins can be converted to a toxoid, uh, whereas endotoxin cannot be converted. These can stimulate. What's a toxoid? So uh, toxoid, uh, Formation is a even more uh, toxic, you know, if it undergoes a change, but can still be uh, toxic, whereas endotoxin cannot be converted. It's only toxic in its current state. Um, I'm not explaining that really well, but I'll, uh, I'll look at that up to get a better explanation for you. Uh, the, the presence of exotoxins will stimulate antitoxins, which are usually antibodies. It's part of the immune response. The problem with endotoxins is they don't stimulate the antitoxin defense. Uh, usually the exotoxins do not cause fever, whereas endotoxins do cause fever. That's one of their hallmarks. Exotoxins are secreted from live cells. Bacteria has to be alive, but in the case of an endotoxin, they can be rele released by dead or dying cells. Exotoxins, a few gram positive and gram negative bacteria can secrete them, but endotoxins is only a uh, found in, in gram negative bacteria. I'm actually going to it look says up. what the toxoid is at the bottom. I just saw it huh. at the end of the chart. Oh, right. A toxoid is an inactivated toxin used in. I'm sorry. So I did not. Right. So I didn't. Uh, I really did not explain that correctly. So <clears throat> the toxins, in the case of exotoxins, we can convert them into something that can be used to an elicit uh, a, a, uh, an antibody response. Basically, they can be used as a vaccine against the toxin, whereas we cannot do that with endotoxins. Oops. Sorry, I hit the wrong thing and jumped back. The, uh, it's also important to, when we talk about antitoxins, what we're usually talking about are antibodies that are produced that will help neutralize a toxin. Um, <clears throat> so bacteria, different uh, bacteria on a blood auger plate can help identify because of either lysis of the uh, blood auger. So this shows you uh, examples of that differentiation of different bacteria by lysis, intracoccus, uh, I can't read the streptococcus gives you these different patterns that are referred to, uh, you can see the beta here, 
is one form of lysis, and these two here is a cause a gamma uh, lysis. Um, I thought there was a slide that explained that more. Many causes of microbial disease are the result of indirect damage or the host's in excessive response or inappropriate response. So we know with COVID, this can happen with the flu, people have a, a real heightened inflammatory response. And this has been uh, obviously uh, a real concern. It can result in respiratory and organ failure. Uh, so finding antiviral drugs that can help uh, mitigate that or rescue people that are having an extreme inflammatory response has become a much bigger area of concern. Supposedly, Gary Gallows, a leading virologist, recently was interviewed in the Baltimore Sun. He's uh, located at the University of Maryland. And he, said, he seems to think that there's going to be a very revolutionary antiviral, um, but still in the stage of study that we might hear about soon. So hopefully that's true. Many cases of microbial disease are the result of indirect damage, as I said, or the host excessive response or an inappropriate response to a microorganism. Pathogeneity is the trait not solely determined. So how we how pathogenic something is can also be determined by our response. And we know that uh, these comorbidities, people have more severe responses um, to a pathogen, to the virus. So it's really a pathogeneity is really an interplay between the virulence of the microbe and how the host immune system is reacting to it. Microbes enter the body and remain confined to a specific tissue. Uh, examples would be boils, fungal skin infection, warts, which are actually caused by uh, a virus, papillomavirus. When infections spread to several sites and tissue fluids, usually in the bloodstream, some exa examples are measles, rubella, chickenpox, and AIDS bacteria such as anthrax and uh, cause of typhoid fever and syphilis, they can spread throughout your body. Uh, various fungal uh, infections such as histoplasmosis and cryptococcus. Agents can travel by means of nerves or the cerebral spinal fluid, not just the uh, blood system. Exits when the infectious agent breaks loose from a local infection is carried to other tissues. Some examples are tuberculosis, streptococcal, pharyngitis, which can become scarlet fever. Uh, toxemia infection can be localized, but the toxins that the bacteria secretes can be carried throughout the body. In some cases, you um, in this um, can happen more often than not. Several agents can establish them themselves simultaneously at an infectious site. So you have a mixed infection of microbes. Polymicrobial diseases such as gas gangrene, wound infection, dental caries, human bite infections, these are all examples of uh, infections caused by a mixed colony of various microbes. So the primary infection is the initial site of infection. The secondary infection occurs when a primary infection is complicated by another infection caused by a different microbe. Acute infections come on rapidly. They have short-lived effects. 
chronic infections can progress and persist over a long period of time. So um, uh, leprosy, the example of that, syphilis, those can all be uh, tuberculosis, all chronic long lasting uh, infections. Some warning signs of disease, uh, the difference between uh, symptoms and signs. A sign is an objective evidence of disease. In other words, you can note something when you look at the patient and tends to be more precise than symptoms. The symptom is what the patient would tell the doctor. So previously, I think I mentioned before Thanksgiving, I was feeling run down and that was my only symptom. I felt very uh, lethargic. I knew something was wrong. Uh, back then, uh, last year, remember the first vaccine for COVID wasn't until December. So I was deeply paranoid that I had a COVID infection and went to a minute clinic and turned out I had uh, influenza B and uh, I only had just that one symptom. I did not have fever or chills, uh, nothing that somebody looking at me would even note that I was uh, not feeling well. A syndrome is a disease identified or defined by a complex uh, uh, group of signs and symptoms together would equal syndrome, and this could be characteristic of a specific disease. Some uh, examples of signs, uh, fever, you know, uh, taking somebody's fever, septicemia, presence of bacteria in tissue fluids, uh, listening to chest sounds, uh, skin eruptions, uh, uh, leukocytosis or leukopenia, swollen lymph nodes. Usually the doctors check for them. They, they listen to chest sounds. An abscess would be obvious. Uh, increased heart rate, uh, measuring the presence of antibodies in a person's serum. Symptoms, uh, experiencing fever, chills, pain, ache, malaise, or fatigue, chest tightness, itching, headache, nausea, abdominal cramps, anorexia, so loss of your appetite, a sore throat, all those wouldn't be readily observed, it would be uh, something somebody would have to uh, tell a doctor or healthcare professional. Earliest signs of a disease are uh, inflammation. Uh, this includes edema, which is swelling, uh, accumulation of fluid at an afflicted uh, tissue site. Uh, if your body's unable to clear infection, this results in granulomas and abscesses. So what your body tries to do, if it can't rid itself of the infection, it tries to wall, it, wall the area off. I'm gonna disconnect my mouse. It's a little problematic. And, and uh, so this is seen like in, uh, like in leprosy, uh, syphilis, uh, your immune system tries to wall off the infected area. Another reaction are swollen lymph nodes. So leukocytosis, uh, so this is something that can be measured, the increased level of white blood cells or the opposite, leukopenia is a decrease in white blood cells. Septicemia is a general state in which microbes multiplying in uh, are present in large numbers in the blood. Bacteriemia, small numbers of bacteria are present but are not multiplying. And viremia is the presence of virus in the blood, whether or not they are actively multiplying.
So some uh, concerns are asymptomatic or subclinical or interparent infections. One of the things that was very important early on with COVID was establishing that asymptomatic people could still transmit the disease. So that's not always the case. Sometimes somebody can be asymptomatic and, and with the disease, with the virus and not transmit it. But with COVID, unfortunately, uh, people that are asymptomatic can transmit the disease. So a host is infected, but does not manifest the disease. In these cases, patient experienced no symptoms or disease. And so the other problem is they do not seek medical attention. Most uh, infections are attended by some sort of sign. In other words, they, uh, you could obviously uh, test somebody uh, for uh, an infection and if they were asymptomatic, but they may not feel sick at all. Portals of exit, uh, uh, the ways that pathogens can leave a host, secretion, excretion, discharge, sloughed off skin, obviously with a lot of respiratory diseases, coughing, sneezing, it's important to remember even talking, uh, things they've found out, just laughing, yelling, singing, these can all expel uh, virus particles, for example. Escape media for pathogens that infect the upper and lower respiratory tract include mucus, septum, nasal drainage, and other moist secretions. The outer layer of the skin and scalp is constantly being shed into the environment. Household dust is actually composed of skin cells, partially. A single person can shed several billion skin cells a day. Some intestinal pathogens cause irritation in the intestinal mucosa that increases the motility of the bowel. So this is what results in uh, diarrhea. Helmuth worms, for example, parasitic worms, they release eggs or cysts through the feces. Feces containing pathogens are a public health problem, especially when allowed to contaminate drinking water or even if they're used to fertilize crops. I forget what state it was, it might've been Florida had a large containment pool of sewage that because of heavy rains was in danger. It did become breach and leaked partially. I don't, I don't think it, uh, I haven't heard uh, the past few days, I guess it didn't, uh, break entirely. Agents involved in sexually transmitted infections leave the host in vaginal discharge or semen, a source of neonatal infections that infect an infant as it passes through the birth canal. So this can be a concern if the mother has herpes, chlamydia, or this uh, fungi candidia albicans. Pathogens that affect a kidney are discharged through the urine. Blood is a portal of exit when it's removed or released through vascular puncture. Blood feeding animals are common transmitters of pathogens such as ticks, fleas, and mosquitoes. They can transmit uh, bacterial infections, viral infections, and even eukaryotic uh, parasites such as malaria. So pathological conditions, there can be a latency period, so dormant state of an infectious agent. During that state, a microbe can periodically become active and produce a reoccurrent disease. 
Sequelae is a long-term or permanent damage to organs and tissues caused by a disease. So in the, uh, the stages of infection, you usually start with an incubation period. So during the incubation period, this is the initial contact with infection agent. Uh, the first symptoms might appear during the incubation period, a prodermal period, so the earliest notable symptoms of infections appear. And then there's an invasive phase when the infectious agent multiplies at high levels. This is during the phase you have the greatest virulence and the infection becomes well established in whatever the target tissue is. Usually you reach an apex and then you have a decline and this is the convalescent stage. The patient's response to the infection and, it, and their symptoms decline. So this is just a graph of that. You can have uh, incubation period and some incubation periods can be quite long depending on the disease. They can even be uh, months and years. So in the prodermal phase, you really start seeing the symptoms become intensified. During that period of invasion, you have very high level of symptoms being experienced. Usually you reach a plateau and then you have a convalescence, the symptoms decline as the person fights off the infection. In some cases, they can have a continuation period where they haven't completely recovered from the disease. Uh, so they would still be having symptoms. Ways in which uh, pathogens persist, reservoirs. There's a lot of re reservoirs in the natural world. Humans or animal carriers can uh, be reservoirs for disease. The soil, water, or plants. Uh, uh, a source is distinct from a reservoir. Uh, individual object from which an infection is acquired. So a reservoir is kind of a broader category. A source would usually be something, usually an individual or an object, not, not a really broad thing like animals, soil, water. So living reservoirs, can include uh, other animals, arthropods, usually uh, insects, mammals, birds, so on. Humans that are actively ill are obviously a reservoir. Some people can enter a carrier state where they recover, but they can still shed, for the example, in hepatitis A. Uh, arthropods were usually concerned with insects, mosquitoes, flies, ticks, lice. They can all be a reservoir of disease. A carrier is an individual who inconspicuously shelters a pathogen and can spread it to others without knowing. People can enter a carrier state but they show no symptoms of a disease. Some examples are gonorrhea, genital herpes, uh, incubating characters, people infected but show no symptoms of a disease, convalescent carriers, so people that are recuperating but can still shed the disease, uh, chronic carriers, individuals who shelter infection for a long period of time, and passive carriers. These could be medical and dental personnel who must constantly handle patients and uh, inadvertently uh, uh, carry a disease from one person to another. Let's 
see if we can finish this. In epidemiology, a live animal, that transmitted an infectious agent from one host to another. Uh, we're talking about vectors here. Majority of vectors are arthropods. So in arthropods, anything has an external skeleton, uh, crabs, lobsters, snails, but what we're mainly concerned with are insects. A biological vector, uh, so some pathogens, uh, they actively participate in the pathogen's life cycle. Uh, they can go through several different stages to reproduce. Uh, serves as a site which a pathogen can multiply or complete its life cycle. <clears throat> the mechanical vectors are not necessary to the life cycle of infectious agent. They're merely transported, but the uh, the vector is not infected. So this could be example uh, would be flies. Flies land on some fecal matter. You're at a picnic, they land on the food. They can, so they're not actively infected, but they're uh, trans, still transmitting a disease. Biological vectors though, they're always infected. Uh, mechanical vectors such as roaches and flies can carry disease on their feet and pass them around. Infectious, indigenous to animals, but transmittable to humans. I'm in trouble seeing my slide here because I can't get rid of this. Okay. So zoonosis, think of zoo as an infectious, uh, it's, that's an infection that's indigenous to animals, but can also be transmitted to humans. So some common ones are uh, the flu that's been uh, transmitted from pigs or uh, from chickens. Uh, the, in the case of the COVID, at some point it originated in bats, probably passed through some other animals to humans. The, uh, what happens then is the infection gets transmitted to humans, so the human becomes a dead-end host. Uh, the human does not contribute to the natural persistence of the microbe. Spread of disease is promoted by close association of humans with animals. So uh, as the world gets more populated and with climate change and so on, we are losing a lot of natural barriers. A lot of, of the wild world is coming in closer contact with humans. Uh, people are eating a lot more exotic animals as food sources which can carry um, disease. People in animal-oriented or outdoor professions are at great risk from zoonotic infections. So obviously people that um, raise animals. Common zoonotic infection, uh, viruses, rabies, yellow fever, Influenza, these can all originate from animals. Some of the bacteria diseases, Rocky Mountain spotted fever from ticks and dogs. Uh, anthrax, for example, domestic animals. The plague is transmitted from rodents and fleas. Uh, ringworm from domestic animals. Toxoplasmosis can be transmitted from cats, particular cat feces, rodents, and birds. Tapeworms can be transmitted from cattle, swine, and fish. Microbes have adapted to nearly every habitat in the biosphere. In other words, soil, water, and air. Most are saporitic and can cause little harm to humans. If, if you remember saporitic organisms, they uh, feed off of the dead and dying, uh, such as what fungi do. 
Some of these uh, microbes are opportunistic pathogens. A few of them are regular pathogens. Communicable disease occurs when an infected host can transmit the infectious agent to another host and establish an infection. So a lot of times we see with these viral infections that have a zoonotic source, they uh, kind of persist for a while in the animal before they mutate enough that they can then get uh, infect humans and then get transmitted from a human to another. Uh, agents that are highly communicable, especially through direct contact or contagious, non-communicable, does not arise through transmission of infectious agent from host to host. So horizontal transmissions, that's uh, how disease, most diseases spread. We get it from someone else. Disease is spread through a population from one infected individual to another. But uh, infections can also go a, a vertical route, which is parent to offspring. Uh, so this can uh, occur with sexually transmitted disease uh, through the placenta or even mother's milk. Patterns of transmission and communicable disease, direct uh, contact with a person through touching, kissing, or sex, droplet contact through sneezing and coughing, uh, horizontal transmission is when it spreads through from one individual to another. So we have the direct, we can have indirect. So this involves uh, a fomite, which is an inanimate object. So for example, somebody touches a doorknob who has the infection on their hand or they touch a faucet, other things in the environment. Uh, vehicles a natural non-living material that can transmit an infectious agent. This can occur through the air, water, soil, and food. So with COVID, we were very concerned with inanimate objects, uh, transmitting disease. It seems to be a low chance, though that doesn't mean zero. But that was a big concern with the hand washing and uh, using hand sanitizer. And uh, of course, you should continue that but is more likely with the respiratory disease through droplets. And as I said before, that is not just coughing and sneezing. It can range from talking, coughing and sneezing. It can include laughing, yelling, singing. All, all of these can result in droplet transmission. So that's an indirect uh, transmission of the disease. Vector transmissions uh, through animals or insects. We already mentioned a mechanical, the, where the animal's not infected. We have biological uh, uh, vectors through bites, either insect bite or an animal bite. So vehicles, any inanimate material commonly used by humans that can transmit infections. A fomite is any inanimate object that harbors and transmit uh, pathogens. Fomites are not a continuous source of infection. The oral fecal route is a common way in which a lot of uh, 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 viruses and bacteria that cause uh, intestinal distress occur that can result in contamination of food and a person, uh, unsuspecting person ingest it. That's why it's, they always have signs in restaurants that the workers have to wash their hands. That's actually pretty important. Water and soil harbor microbes that can uh, sicken humans, can be temporarily uh, contaminated with pathogens that come from humans. The air, indoor air, 
the service in uh, support media, obviously when you're inside, it's more concentrated, uh, depends on the uh, airflow of your uh, indoor environment. This can result in dispersal of respiratory pathogens by dropper, droplet, nuclei, or aerosols. It's a gross picture, but it illustrates an important point. Droplet nuclei are dried microscopic residues created with microscopic pellets of mucus and saliva ejected from the mouth and nose. Aerosols are suspension of fine dust or moisture particles in the air that contain live pathogens. Infectious diseases that are acquired or developed during a hospital stay. These are healthcare associated infections. Uh, the rates of hospital associated infections can range from 0.1 to 20% of all admitted patients. So uh, this is just a graph of the percent changes that we've seen in uh, hospital-associated infections. Medical asepsis practices that lower the microbial load in patients, caregivers, and the hospital environment. Surgical asepsis, ensuring all surgical procedures are conducted under sterile Conditions, hospitals should have an infection control officer who implements proper practices and procedures. They are charged with tracking potential outbreaks, identifying breaches, training other healthcare workers. Uh, I don't know if any of you work in an, a large and uh, scale environment. I work at NIH, we have asymptomatic testing and they alert us whenever um, somebody's positive. Uh, a lot of times they're asymptomatic, but they test positive. And they will tell us when the last time they were in the building and what floor they were on. And they always institute contact tracing to find out uh, who the person was in contact with. Using Koch's postulates, uh, if you remember, he was that uh, scientist, the first one who taught a course in microbiology. And this was an early method to determine the causative agent of a disease. Uh, so he developed a standard for determining that. And his postulates were a series of proofs that help establish classic criteria for etiological studies, which is determining the causative agent. So he did this with uh, anthrax, studying anthrax. So the first step is finding evidence of a particular microbe in every case of the disease. So you have a group of people that are getting sick that they all have the same microbe present in their body uh, and then taking that and culturing it in a lab, other ways, otherwise being able to isolate a pure form of the microbe that's causing the infection. The third step would be to test it in an organism. Can you take what you isolated in the lab and inject it into an animal? And do they get a disease state? The last step would be taking the disease animal and can you isolate from them the causative agent, which should be the same causative agent that you originally isolated. This would help establish uh, that this really did cause the infection, whatever it is, bacteria or a virus. Okay, so it's 9.30. I'm going to stop 
here. Uh, I think there's just a few slides left. And I will uh, we'll just have a quick wrap up of this next week, and then we'll start our immunology uh, section. So uh, I'm going to stop the sharing and stop.